Thank you, and welcome to all of you. I'll keep remember that you can write your questions in, and Jeff will try to monitor those, and we'll try to address those as we uh, complete this webinar. But we're going to be a little bit, I was telling Jeff this, a little worried that this might be a bit like drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, German research is wonderful, uh, but it can have some complexities. And the language problem does get in a few people's way. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. I've tried to identify key concepts today that will allow us to get you introduced and understanding the basics of German research so you can decide just how far you want to take it from there. We're going to talk a bit about the nature of German ancestry, and I don't want to sound too American-centric. I recognize that uh, there are registrations and registered uh, viewers from all over the world, but it will be oriented a bit more towards those people who are already in North America with German ancestors, but that doesn't matter uh, when it gets down to using German records. Uh, so we will discuss the issue of the German language and tell you just how easy German is to learn. Uh, we'll talk about German places, German jurisdictions, which are critical to understand in order to figure out where the records are that you need to look at. And so then we'll talk a little bit about the major records for German research. And this is one of those issues that makes German research easier than those of you who've been struggling with British and uh, American research, where there are a wide variety of records, but not as good a coverage of some of those records. And then we'll end with some helpful tools for German research. So that's our general outline. The, those of you who will be listening to this on the CD um, in the future will have the handout that goes with this, a few pages with uh, um, specifics. Uh, those of you uh, later can pause the recording to write things down if you wish to. But let's um, first of all talk about German ancestry, uh, the background and the popularity. There are a lot of Germans in the US, and we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about the history of German settlement and get people a little bit acquainted with that. Some of you probably have German ancestors you don't know about yet, uh, ones that you found that you know are from Germany or German-speaking, and ones that you will still find in the future that you haven't run into yet. So we'll get acquainted with some of the departure and arrival ports and the issue about the immigrant's place of origin, so uh, as well as their religion. These are all issues that are great background to have as we move into doing German research. So the first thing to know is that you are not alone as a person with German ancestry. There were about 8 million German immigrants coming into the United States, people who spoke German, um, maybe even more, but that's the, the numbers we've been able to count so far. And there are millions more who came into Canada, who moved to Eastern Europe, and later their ancestors come to uh, other countries. Germans settled parts of Southern Africa, parts of South America, and from there, some of you may be in some of those countries today. Uh, with German ancestors in Brazil, for instance, or in other places. Um, and the things we talk about pertain to wherever you have a German ancestor. Eventually, it's going to wind your way back to one of the German states. It is the number one ancestry in the United States. Since 1990, when the Census Bureau was asking each individual what this person's ancestry was, Germany has been the number one ancestry. About 50 millions of Americans claim German ancestry. Uh, they may have other ancestors as well. Um, my wife, for instance, is where my family gets all its German ancestors, uh, but she has a lot more than just Germans. And uh, so the same is true with many of us. For those of you who are interested, as of the 2000 census, here's a list of the top 20 German states in the US with their percentage. So you can see that North Dakota was almost half German. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, over 40%. So there's a number of, of um, states, all the way down to Maryland, where even there, 15% of the people in Maryland claimed German ancestry. Uh, so you can see that it's been broadly distributed throughout the United States, heavily in the north. And uh, time just doesn't allow us to go into all the background about where all the Germans settled. But we will talk a little bit about that. The first major settlement of Germans began in 1683 to Pennsylvania, although History books will remind us that even in Jamestown in 1608, there are a few Germans who got off that ship as well and were helping those early settlers. Uh, but the first um, congregation or source group to come was in 1683 Pennsylvania. The first large numbers came in 1710 to New York. They soon found that the New York government was not as comfortable for them, and many of them migrated to Pennsylvania, and future uh, immigrants from that 1700s, many came to Pennsylvania. 
1732, they started uh, colonies down in South Carolina as well. From those Germans in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, migration moved south into Virginia, uh, primarily through the Shenandoah Valley, which is in the western part of Virginia. And from there, they bled into Kentucky, into some of the Carolinas and beyond. Uh, as time moved forward into the uh, early 1800s, migration went west out of Pennsylvania and New York into Ohio and the rest of the Midwest. And then um, in the 1800s, we get a lot of direct immigration into places like Missouri, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Texas, and a half a dozen other states that I could list. So if I didn't list your state, it's not that we're ignoring them. Uh, there's always so much room on one of these screens to, to put that information. Uh, just to show you the ebb and flow, uh, the U.S. didn't start really tracking immigrants until 1820. So for almost 200 years, Germans came without a lot of tracking. Most of them ended up coming, as I said, into Pennsylvania, uh, into, into some of the other states. But starting in 1820, when the government started counting immigrants and identifying where they came from, you can see a large number of Germans, particularly increasing in the 1840s into the 1850s. It sort of paralleled the Irish famine immigration in those early years, just by a few years, the Irish came a bit ahead of the Germans. And then the Germans started coming uh, heavily after 1848 when there was a failed revolution over among some of the German states. Then you can see in the 1880s it climbed to a peak of almost a million and a half people, Germans, in that decade. And then it began to drop off um, with an increase in the 1950s, as you'll notice, which of course represents a lot of Germans leaving after the Second World War concluded. Uh, a lot of those would be Germans from Eastern Europe who had fled into Germany and then uh, came to the United States. And uh, with the stabilization of relations in Germany, uh, Germans have generally stayed uh, over there in the last re in recent years. But it's a fascinating way to look at where those eight million immigrants came from. Uh, just to give you a feel of where they settled, this is a map. Uh, you'll find at the progenealogist.com website. I was one of the founders of that company. And um, my colleague, Gary Horlocker, put this map together about where they settled in the 18th century. That's the 1700s. And you'll see that they didn't miss too many states. There are a few even in the Boston and Maine area. But you see that large swath through the Hudson Valley in New York, through much of southeastern Pennsylvania, into the western parts of Virginia, and down even into the Carolinas. Uh, there were Germans were settling. So that gives you a flavor at that point in time. Uh, so where were they leaving from? Well, again, it depends a little bit. Uh, in the 1700s, most of the Germans actually sailed out of the Dutch port of Rotterdam, uh, some of them out of Amsterdam. The German ports, uh, we'll talk about them in a minute, uh, tended to be more cargo oriented and they didn't see people as cargo back in those days. Um, however, in the 1800s, they began to understand that Bremen one of the major shipping ports of the, of the Germans, realized in the 1820s and 30s that, you know what, people paid for passage. And so they developed a very thriving business. And Hamburg decided they weren't going to let Bremen um, take all the credit and have all the issues. So they also started doing a lot more sailing. Meanwhile, the ports in Rotterdam uh, at the head of the Rhine River started silting up a little bit at the same time when the ships started getting bigger and deeper. And so the Dutch ports became less relevant in the 1800s, although Antwerp in Belgium and Le Havre in France uh, were the ports of choice for a lot of Germans, particularly those leaving from southern parts of Germany who just had to travel um, west to those ports instead of up north to Bremen or Hamburg. In the 1900s, those continued to be major ports, but also Trieste uh, on the border essentially between Italy and, and uh, Croatia, uh, where you have a lot of Eastern Germans from the Austrian Empire, from Eastern Europe, uh, even those leaving from the Russian Empire, uh, from the uh, Black Sea Germans, as we sometimes call them, uh, in the Ukraine and those areas, uh, tended to leave uh, from some of those more southern Mediterranean ports like Trieste. But most of us start looking at their arrival ports, and when we're in the United States, we're more interested in where they arrived. I thought you might enjoy this little picture from Harper's Weekly, a New York publication in 1874, just showing the flood of Germans anxious to get on a board and, and come over on a steamer to the United States. And where did they arrive in the United States? Well, in the 1700s, they primarily arrived in Philadelphia. I mentioned the uh, 1710 contingent that sailed into New York. But um, most of them were coming into Philadelphia. A few settled down in Charleston, South Carolina, and a few other areas like that. But the vast majority in the 1700s came into Philly. Uh, 
In the 1800s, New York was taking over the whole immigration business, as it were. Uh, by about the 1820s or 30s, New York was seeing as many immigrants coming there from all over the world as in the other major ports. Germans tended to come into New York, but they also still continued to come into Philadelphia. Many came into Baltimore. A surprising number came into New Orleans and Galveston. Indeed, many of you are aware that, that places like St. Louis were major German cities. If you have a goal in Germany of going to St. Louis, uh, one of the ports you might choose to go to is New Orleans, because you could go straight up the Mississippi River rather than having to take a train or a combination of boats and, and, um, and ox cart and wagons to get overland to St. Louis. So depending upon where you chose to settle, it had some impact on what port you came to. However, when you're doing your research, the, uh, the uh, rule of thumb is always start by looking in New York if you are in the 1800s, because it became very quickly the go-to port. In the 1900s, those who were coming uh, came in any, all of those ports, but especially Ellis Island, uh, with its 20 or so million arrivals in the 1900s, from the 1890s to the 1920s. Uh, many of those were Germans. Uh, of course, many of those were, were ethnic Germans coming from countries that didn't have the German name in them. They may have been Hungary, Germans who lived in Hungary, Germans who lived in Croatia, Germans who lived in later Yugoslavia, uh, all because those are areas in the eastern parts of Europe that have been settled by Germans. So, where did all those Germans come from? Well, we talked about that just a little bit. That's really the $64,000 question, because that's where the issue of German research really gets a bit of a hang-up for some people. It is critical information for you to learn the specific town where your German ancestor came from. Uh, many of you may know the specific town. You might just know the, the German state, such as Prussia or Bavaria, that they came from. But ultimately, you'll need to learn the, uh, the specific town. Maybe, Jeff, that's a, a seminar we can do, a webinar we can do in the future about how to learn that information. But at this point, I'm just going to point out the value of that, because the specific hometown is where the records are going to be that you need in order to find and go more with your, further back with your German ancestry. Because in the various German states, records were kept at the local level, primarily at the church, but even at the town level. They did not do what England did in the 1830s, which was to create a national registration of births. That makes British research after 1836 so wonderful, because there is a nationwide index to the people in England being born after that date. That doesn't happen in Germany. It still doesn't happen in Germany. Even today, there is no national index to German births. Now, the answer to this question of where your German came from is going to be found in the new country they came to, whether they came to Canada, to the United States, whether they came to Brazil or Argentina or South America uh, or South Africa, wherever they came to, the answers are usually in the records of that new country. So in America, you need to be looking at a variety of records. And you need to search all the possible sources in American records for a clue as to the name of the ancestral town. It might be on a passenger list, but it's usually not. It might be on a naturalization record, but in America, not usually until 1906. And all of you with immigrants who came in the 1800s, they probably naturalized before 1906. So naturalization records often don't answer that question. Sometimes their obituary will give it. Sometimes the cemetery record will give it. Sometimes the uh, German-American church they attended will have that reference in a marriage record or a death burial record. So there's a lot of sources in America to look for it. Okay. You also want to learn about the religion of your family. And the religion in Germany was relatively simple. Okay. The importance of learning the ancestor's religious preference is because when you get to searching in Germany, you'll be searching in church records primarily. And they are the tool that you're going to use for most of your German research. In most of German settled areas, there are two primary denominations. Germans tended to be either Roman Catholic or they were Lutheran. That's often called the Evangelische Kirche, or church. Occasionally, they were Reformed. Uh, it depended at some point in time on the potential uh, of that particular state. If the prince or duke or king decided to be Lutheran or Catholic, then the rest of the community was, the rest of the state was, to a degree. That changed over time uh, after the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, but it still became very um, pocketed. There are areas where an entire state might be Catholic, but one or two valleys tend to be heavily Protestant, 
because at one point in time there was a duke or a count in that valley who was 